Well, hello everyone. Hello everyone. How are you? You happy, Paul? I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm awesome. Thank you very much. In my little cupboard, it's peaceful, tranquil, and I'm getting to hear some fantastic uh, talks from from everyone, including yourself. Welcome, Abby Paul Bandari. We've got him here to talk to us today about transformational one to ones. But before we get into that, and I'm a huge music fan, uh, did you know that um, Abby Paul is the only person ever? to be credited with creating Bangra Funk on BBC Late Night Radio. You created a whole genre. A whole genre, yeah. In my bedroom as well. In your bedroom? <laughs> yes. Well, there's probably a whole story behind that. But um, I'll hand over to you to talk to us about, you know, this, the, you know, one-to-ones, a big part of people's lives when they work professionally in organisations. Transformational one to ones, very keen to hear about your take on that. So over to you, Abby Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to hit the share button. And I'm going to share this. You can see that well. Cool. Okay, so this talk was um, originally called Transformational One to Ones. Um, but I've learned that <clears throat> the word transformation can kind of suggest like you're going from one state to another, like from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And then once you've reached that end state, then that's it, you know, you're done. And that's not true because, you know, we all know that change is continuous and we continue to grow. So transformation isn't the greatest word. And uh, let me just get my mouse cursor here. So it's not transformational anymore. It, it, the talk is now one-to-ones that can help individuals in their path of professional development and happiness with a hint of impacting the wider team group slash org. Um, and just a quick intro to me. Yes, that is my face on a mug. That was a secret Santa gift. I didn't put my own face on a mug. Um, but yeah, I've been known as many things in my career, engineer, program manager, TPM, uh, even an engineering manager at one point. Um, but Agile has been the core of what I've been doing for a long time. And so, yeah, completely love it. Um, the next, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've said not to be confused with um, Paul the Indo Funk musician, but yeah, that's me. Uh, so, could, go please check me out over there on Spotify. Um, you might enjoy it. And um, yeah, so what are we going to be talking about today? So, I'm going to talk about why I'm covering this. Going to have an activity, hopefully, if, if Rob is feeling up for it. I'm going to start the story, tell the true story about uh, when I use this one-to-one -one format. Um, I'm also going to talk about the one-to-one -one format itself. Um, I'm going to provide some tips, and there might be a quiz, and then I'm going to talk about the story, and then there'll be a conclusion, and obviously it's time for questions. So why am I talking about one-to-ones at an Agile conference? So what's the first um, Agile manifesto value statement? By the way, um, if you can, please chat, use the chat. I'm hoping for this to be interactive, so I will be watching the chat. I mean, if people want to say hello now, that would be awesome. Um, but yeah, the first Agile Manifesto value statement is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So there's a big focus on people. And if you think about Agile and, you know, Scrum events, there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of focus on people being able to communicate speak their truth and be honest and stuff. And, yeah, there's a lot of talk about psychological safety. Uh, I know a lot of people are into Amy Edmondson's work. Um, you know, how the information needs to surface from people's brains and get comfortable to do that and not judge, etc. So Agile talks about the people side of things, but you know, doesn't really provide much guidance. So, you know, that's where lots of other tools and processes come from, or techniques come in handy. Also, there's a there's a, an Agile manifesto principle which says to Build projects around motivated individuals. So you give them the environment and support that they need. So support and trust them to get the job done. So motivated individuals, environment and support, trust, and ultimately autonomy. And this this talk talks a lot about that. Um, and so I am going to tell the true story about uh, how this this one-to-one -one format was instrumental in moving along transforming a group that I worked with. I joined the group as a program, director, program manager, and um, it was quite dysfunctional to begin with, and very aggressive, 
and uh, the end result was this this one to one format actually helps uh, with the connections, improve relationships, and psychological safety and productivity. And I'm also going to talk about this because I've worked um, in engineering leadership teams um, at a few companies, and there is a bit of a, a theme sometimes um, with leaders. There's sometimes this notion of how people are not accountable, they're just not doing what we expect of them. So there's a disconnect between leadership and the workforce. Uh, fingers pointed, there's a resentment, and the resentment leads to more dictatorial, dictatorial leadership styles. And then skilled people are not doing what they know to work best, they're just doing what they're told. And then there's subpar solutions, and then better morale, and that leads to attrition. Uh, and I'm hoping that this talk can help. Um, but before we start, Rob has kindly volunteered um, to talk for a minute about something that makes him really happy, that brings him a lot of joy. And what I would like you to do is, and I'm hoping that you can try some comments on this in the chat, what I'm hoping for you to do is to actually watch him really carefully, watch his, the way he's talking about what he's talking about, his expression, his gestures, tone of voice, all that stuff. And yeah, Rob, um, maybe I'll stop sharing for a second um, so we can do this. Okay. Yeah. Let me talk for a minute about something that makes me happy. Yeah, like loads of joy. <clears throat> like your yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I uh, other than also doing things like this, working with people in Agile, I'm a singer. I sing uh, in a band. I, I am in a band. Um, and this year I've been... Um, very fortunate to be singing in front of audiences uh, in the UK, at weddings, at private functions uh, with my band every weekend since May. Um, and I love it. It's it's a real expression of me. I'm singing other people's songs, but that's good. I like to take on other people's songs, see if I can sing them maybe better than the original singer. I have my own interpretation of the songs. I really love being part of a band because... It's an amazing experience to have other people, like four or five people playing different instruments and it all coming together. And, you know, you can't recreate that. It, has, it takes the some parts of everyone to create that music. And I'm a part of it. Um, and the joy it brings to other people, you, know, you, can't, you can't beat that. You cannot beat yeah. the warmth you get from your audience when you're singing and playing music and people are dancing and, and, and clapping. It's fantastic. Yeah. So that would be like that's amazing, but that was amazing. That made me yeah, completely resonate with all of what you just said. That. Um, so we've already had a comment, um, Maria. Said, oh my God, your eyes just light up. Totally. I mean, I felt that. Like, you know, wow. Um, any other thoughts there? Any other observations about Rob, gentle gestures? Okay. It seems to be it's tough to Okay. So. I'm not sure if anyone noticed, but like I, I actually noticed how much energy you had. All of a sudden, your eyes lit up, as I really said. Facial expressions, hands moving, lots of energy, and um, and then you know, I'm just going to ask a question. I mean, how did that make people feel? How did you feel watching that? I'll give people a few seconds to answer the question. Mm. Did I inspire anyone to be a singer in a band? Inspiring. I want to hear you sing to see you in your band. Yeah, that's great. What are you Actually, I don't have my band with me, so, you know. So, I, I, I genuinely felt happy listening to you be happy. And this is where I'm going to share my presentation again. And I think, you know, uh, Kathy says uh, it was inspiring. And yeah, it was. And inspiring kind of means that it's energizing for you as well. And so if you were feeling happy like I was listening to Rob talk, then what that's called is neural resonance. So it's actually rooted in science. So when we closely observe another person's face, their gestures, their voice, our brain begins to align with theirs. And that lets us know more fully what they're thinking and feeling. So, you know, that's essentially empathy. So, um, you know, we tend to think of empathy as being very soft, but actually it's quite, a, it's rooted in science. Um, okay, so the story. 
like I said, I was a program leader just doing this program, and they were very uh, skeptical and cynical of me um, because, hey, who's this guy that's coming here to talk to us and you know, tell us what to do? Um, I was there to introduce Agile, help them with the processes, um, and you know, I was being. This picture kind of reflects like me being shouted into a corner because I stated from a perspective like, why do we have to do this? Why can't we just get on with real work? Um, and so what I did, and I had no agenda when I did this initially. I just thought as a program lead, I, I was thinking of myself as a scrum master with admin over here. Um, so I said, I'm going to meet with everyone in the program, there were about between 20 and 30 people. Um, and so I scheduled a regular meeting with everyone. And I just thought I could listen to what they had to say. Um, and for some reason, it made people very happy. Um, so there was an offsite, and people were talking about what they want to do more of, and they said, oh, we want to do more of those one-to-ones. What's going on? Why is this? Why do people want to speak with me? Um, so then I thought, what am I actually doing here? And so this is we're going into the one-to-one -one format. And essentially, what I was doing was a, a mix of uh, coaching and mentoring. And um, does anyone know the kind of main difference between coaching and mentoring? Essentially, when you're mentoring, you're giving the answers because you're coming from a place of experience. Someone's coming to you saying, right, you've done what I'm wanting to do, what I hope to do. So can you tell me how you went about this? It's like, yes, now you should do this, now you should do that. So very much guiding someone. Coaching is where you ask exploratory questions to enable someone to explore their own options and create their own solutions on how to progress. Um, so I, I was taking a coaching course at the time uh, when, I was, when I was doing this. And so I took a coaching approach to the um, to the ones to ones, and it was really an effort to try and hold back and not just give people the solutions. Like you know, it's a real effort to just say, you know, and I know the answer to this, but I'm not going to give it to them. They have to arrive at this themselves. And so, what were the questions? So, if you think about traditional one to ones, um, they tend to be kind of like very much hierarchical. The manager will say, okay, here's the agenda. This is what we're going to talk about. Uh, this is what you're doing. Get that done by the next time you meet. Great one to one. That's an interesting pub. But what I was doing was I was asking, uh, what would you like to discuss? And what this does is it puts the ball in their court. They own the agenda. Um, and so it's, it's up to them to think about okay, what's important to me. And so what you will learn is what's important to them, what makes them happy what's annoying them, things that they want to improve, what they're passionate about. And sometimes I would ask, what would you like to discuss today? And then, yeah, nothing really. So I'd ask trigger questions. So what's been going well? Ah, uh, actually this. Uh, what hasn't been going well? It's not like retro questions and they kind of are. But also there could be things on specific things that you want to discuss. So what are your thoughts on X? And so in my case, I've got a really interested in their thoughts on you know, how the process is working and their thoughts on improvement. And what I found was in the one-to-ones, they were actually sharing a lot more information than when they were in the teams um, or in group conversations. And they would actually create solutions speaking with me. And I was like, oh, okay, um, why don't, do you mind if we take that solution to the team? And they would say, uh, yeah, sure. You know. And then they would see that I was actually invested in them and you know, actually using their ideas and helping them support, supporting them in their ideas to actually help improve the team. And then the next question is, um, anything I can do to help? And with this, you know, as, as managers, as leaders, it's like showing that we really are there to help support them. It's not about them getting, getting them to do what we want them to do. It's about them actually uh, supporting them in their endeavors. And remember, I wasn't trusted. So I was fairly senior in the org, and then they were, I'm there asking, what can I do to help you? Again, this was helping to establish trust. And you've got to be sincere when you're doing this, um, because I've overheard managers giving this, uh, going through this format, and when they've asked these questions, it just doesn't feel sincere. So you genuinely have to want to actually help them without judgment. And I also asked, what feedback do you have from me? Um, and what response do you think I got from that? It was mostly, um, no, I'm fine. No, you're good. Um, 
But it's important, if, if you are familiar with Amy Edmonds' work about psychological safety, what she says is um, leaders need to be vulnerable, and we need to, in order to create a psychologically safe culture, uh, culture we need to show this humility. Um, and so leaders asking for feedback shows that, hey, look, I don't have all the answers, and I do make mistakes. Um, and so then people will know that it's safe to fail, and it's safe to learn from your failure. And that's how we grow. That's how we resolve issues in the system, for example. Um, and so obviously when I ask a question, what do you have for me? That's all good, mate. So then I'd be more specific. Is there anything I can be doing more of? Anything I can do less of? Or well, sometimes, you know, you know where you're not doing so well, you know where you screwed up. It's like, what about this thing, this specific thing I feel I could have done there? Essentially, I was asking for advice. And when you ask for advice, people are more than willing to give it to you. Um, and yeah, this uh, this worked really well. People would volunteer information. Sometimes you know, people are so used to it by the time that they met me, they're like, oh, by the way, I've got some feedback for you. It's like, great, this is fantastic. And obviously, you thank people as they give you the feedback. And the next uh, question is actually deeply rooted in coaching. It's, and what else? And this is where you pause and you stop. And this can be really great for, the, for people just to dig deep. And you want to be kind of pausing and asking this question as many times as it's as to make it uncomfortable. Um, there's this book called The Coaching Habit by, I'm going to uh, mess up this pronunciation, Michael Dongay Stania, I think is his name. And he said this is the most powerful coaching question in the world. Um, and this is where you, you are actually really curious about their ideas. Um, so for example, if they're coming up with some actions, they might come up with an action and you can ask, and what else? And pause, and then they will think, and please use the silence. The silence is really useful. Um, it, it forces people to dig deeper and they will actually generate new ideas that they didn't have previously and they will surprise themselves. So very useful question. If you're interested in coaching models that talk specifically about leading to actions, these are two that I can recommend, the Grow Model and Oscar. There's plenty of information online about these. Um, I won't go into much detail about these, but um, yes, I can recommend them. But it wasn't just about mentor, uh, sorry, coaching. I would ensure that I established the conversation in coaching to show this is your meeting, this is your driving, this is your control, this is your career that you're in control of, and I'm here to help you. But also, given that I, you know, obviously more experienced and agile, etc., um, and you know, I was generally older than most people on the, on the program, etc. So I had some experience, and people were going through what I had been through previously. And so this is where I kind of turned into mentoring. So you know, I might have had some feedback for them. Like, oh, I would observe the following, um, or you know, oh, this might help you. Um, and sometimes they would actually be actively asked for my help. Um, However, what I would say is, initially there was a lot of aggression towards me, and so when I was giving feedback, it, it would result in this response. And you know, the the, the fight or flight response kicks in. Usually, it's a natural response. The amygdala. To like this emotional response, like no, nope, I don't like this fight or flight. So what I tend to do is when I when I deliver feedback is I frame it, frame the conversation in empathy. Um, and so it isn't empathy is not necessarily about agreeing with them, but it's showing them that you understand their perspective. Um, and as the amygdala generates that fear, it's an emotional response. Um, if you label the emotion. So you, some people may have read uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, he talks about this. Um, if you label the emotion, what it does is it moves the, uh, it moves the conversation to areas of the brain which are more about rational thinking, so it moves it to the cortex, so away from the amygdala. So the sooner you can label the emotion, like it seems like you're quite frustrated about this, it seems like you're quite nervous. And so, as soon as you do that, it actually moves it to another part of the brain where you can have rational conversations and actually the person is more open and they, they leave that fight or flight response. And um, psychotherapists' uh, research has said that when people feel completely listened to, they're more open to taking on board new ideas um, and they're less defensive. And what I've also learned as I was studying in coaching is there are three levels of listening. There's internal listening and that's like your general conversation of just listening to respond like, Oh, you went on holiday. Yeah, yeah, so did we. We went over here. It was great. 
Um, and 80% of us are having those conversations. They're very superficial, not very, you know, there's not much depth to them. Then level two is listening to understand. So you listen intently, you observe the nonverbal communication. That's what we were doing with, with Rob. So, oh, you went on a holiday. Why did you choose that location? Oh, right. So they had childcare, of course, you've got kids. Okay, cool. And so you're kind of getting a bit more understanding. You're listening to their tone of voice, we talked about earlier. And then there's level three, which is um, global listening. So that's using like, the force, like intuition. You're listening to them, but you're also listening to what isn't being said. Is that so? Okay, so you want your kids to be looked after while you're on holiday. We can all draw our assumptions as to why that might be. It's also important to be very conscious of your posture in the one to ones. And I find this is true in remote one to ones as well as real IRL, real life ones. Um, and I, I try and be as neutral as possible. That's why I've chosen this image. This guy has a very, fairly um, neutral posture. He's fairly open. He's not too open. He's not closed. Um, and he's leaning forward a bit to show that he's interested. Um, and also be very aware of uh, this approach called mirroring. So when you mirror someone and their, their tone, their posture, etc., what you're saying to them unconsciously is, we're alike, and um, that can actually help to comfort others, and you probably find yourself doing this already. Um, okay, the next slide, um, I was kind of hoping for a bit more interaction on the chat, um, but we'll see how this goes. If anyone's feeling brave to chat, please do. Um, I was gonna ask if anyone can recognize what these facial expressions mean. Does anyone? know how this person might be feeling right now in this picture. Okay, happy. The, the lean to the left there of the face. Oh yes, thank you. Happy and relaxed, he is happy. And now this, this one, the next picture with the lean, Questioning, surprised, wondering, yes. Uh, curiosity, so that the, the lean represents the curiosity. How about this one? Annoyed, yeah, not liking, doesn't seem very happy. You can see from the shape of the mouth, round. How about this one? It's not a good with me at least. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to put a rush through this because uh, disagreeing, we kind of discussed it really. Um, this one, shock, not very happy, and um, if you have that in your uh, one to ones, then it's probably HR. Uh, ratio. Um, okay, back to the story. Thanks for those, by the way. It's very, I'm just very conscious of the time. Back to the story. So, um, took the approach of kind of using three lenses. So the, the telephoto lens on the individuals, that's kind of been the focus of this talk. Um, but then with the wide angled lens, it's kind of like in, at the team level, we were doing things such as agile coaching. This is where you could think about the autonomy and giving them control. That's essentially using the similar coaching techniques to do that. So I'd step back and let others facilitate meetings, etc. But also on the, on the ultra wide angle, it was about uh, giving people the context of this is what we're doing. I would talk openly about psychological safety, etc. It wasn't I wasn't hiding any of this. I'm just being very honest and sharing this kind of stuff, as well as talking about the response of the team, etc. And so the end result was improved psychological safety. They were running their actual perspectives without me. They'd embraced this. Uh, individuals were actually prospering and progressing in their career. Productivity was up. Generally higher morale as well. Um, and so I've, I've actually given this talk a number of places and it's kind of uh, gone down really well at other companies, etc. But the feedback I've had is if people don't share my values as they're genuinely there to help others, then it won't work. And I, as I said, um, yes, high commitment too. Um, and yeah, if, if, if you're not sincere about helping others and really giving them the space to grow, then yes, this format won't work. Um, so you really have to genuinely want to help. 
And I've also been told that it won't scale because it's two individuals speaking. But my, my thinking is that, you know, if everyone in the company, like all the leaders, all the managers, use this approach, intentionally use a coaching style of leadership, then this will grow, this will spread. And in fact, what happened was we actually asked two individuals, two developers who really got on and said, do you mind using this one-on-one -on -one format with each other? And they did, and they said it worked really well. Um, and uh, then they started doing it with other people. And so organically, this spread. So this focus on coaching and giving other people space to grow and just being very empathetic, it spread throughout the group organically without actually us even trying to intentionally do that. So here are the questions again. Um, now, if you think about these as themes, like what would you like to discuss that's empowering? Anything I can do to help that's support? What feedback do you have for me that's humility, vulnerability, and what else that's showing curiosity? And above all, and I've said this word a lot of times, but empathy is hugely important in this approach. And I may get swell just to emphasize that. Um, there are some books that I would recommend. This is, uh, this is where I've got a lot of this from. Um, and I would ask of you, if you're a leader, if you're a manager, if, even if you're not, like what can you do to improve your relationships with your peers, with your reports, with your leaders, with your managers, by using some of these techniques? And uh, thanks for listening. And any questions? Thank you very much, everybody, Paul. Yes, questions into chat, please. Um, as usual, I'll kick off as we're waiting for people to type things in there. Fantastic, again, really, really insightful stuff. Um, what would you advise to people? So this is uh, primarily kind of aimed at those giving one-to-ones, i.e., you know, I may be a leader or a project leader or a, or a, um, a team lead, and I want to have one-to-ones with people that work with me or for me. What about if you're... The recipient of this one for one's a better word of a one from you know you're the participant rather than one asking the questions what rec what tips would you recommend to people wanting to get better ones ones from people that they're receiving them from if you're you know you're not the one doing the questioning or, to, or, in, or coaching and mentoring you're the recipient of it is there anything they can do to improve their experience yeah that's a, that's a really good question i think um if you're not satisfied with your current one to one i think um this is where you've kind of got to be a bit brave and provide the person running you one to one, be your manager, whoever, um, the feedback. You know, this is what I would expect. This is what I would like for my one to one. I would like to give the opportunity to talk about these issues, or at least this is my agenda. Um, and if you've got a respectful relationship, then that should be, they should listen to you and actually say, yeah, that's cool. Fantastic. Uh, here we got a question coming through now. What if I do not feel safe to suggest that? What if it's, I guess you kind of put it back, it's like, do we, do we start with a level of trust, I guess? It's interesting. So um, that's a very good question. I think you probably should ask yourself why you're not feeling safe. Uh, what specifically uh, prevents you from having these conversations? Um, I, quite recently, I can't go into too much detail, but um, I joined a company where um, the dynamic with my manager wasn't particularly great. Um, and I realized that if it continued like this, I wasn't going to be happy there. And um, you know, they were fairly aggressive in how they were talking to me. So I had to actually kind of put the strategy together about how I would actually speak with this person, plan it out, um, ensure that I showed that I understood his perspective. Um, and using that technique really does diffuse the situation. Um, and when I had the conversation with him, it actually turned out to be a really, it was a turning point. They really respected the conversation and um, treated me completely different from there. And it was very much a mutual respect at that point. So I guess what I'm saying is understand the reasons why you don't feel safe, but also having the conversation and find the conversation will be hugely beneficial to you and you'll probably find you a lot more confident and comfortable with that person moving on. Excellent. Thank you very much. Andy. Any more questions for Avi? Also, I appreciate this. Here we go. Like the plan dialogue, what I need to say, and what I need to hear, and just bravely go out. So that's confirmation there. 
affirmation of what you just said there. It's been a, a really good plan there. It's great to yeah, have absolutely. a preparation, isn't it? That's, I think that's a really good thing to prepare. Um, and less confrontation, I guess, if you've got some measured approach to what you want to discuss. Yeah, plan it out. Um, I'm not sure about the dialogue, but I would say definitely the points that you want to discuss. Mm. Uh, but also show that you understand their perspective. So, uh, and frame the conversation with them. Uh, and so also show empathy they, towards those you're having the conversation with as well. So they, in kind, show empathy towards you. Yes. Thanks for the Fantastic. We're all, we're all, we're all, we love a, a bit of empathy in the agile space, don't we? So it's just about using that in a, in a, in a, in a one-to-one -one conversation as well as thinking about it as a, it's not exclusively something we think about with customers. It also happens with our one-to-one day-to-day relationships. And that's what, what we're talking about at the end of the day. It's relationships, aren't they? We're trying to foster with people we spend most of our time with. You know, we work with these people nine days, nine hours a day, five days a week. Very important topic. Yeah. yeah awesome. Thank well, you. no more questions. Thank you very much. Um, Abby Paul, again, anyone's got any further questions, please reach out to Abby Paul and, and, and connect or, or put more questions into the chat. We will collect all these questions up and, uh, and, and get more answers back to you if we can. Um, but it is, uh, what time is it? It is 12.46. You now have, thank you, Abby Paul, we now have uh, a lunch break. Uh, 29 minutes left on that lunch break, so I won't take too much of it up because you probably need to prepare things. And we'll see you back here on the online track at 1.15 with our next set of speakers. But have a great lunch and see you all very shortly. See you soon.